Dr. Ranjan uh, Giovanna Picotti in uh, Interact, uh, who is co-sponsoring this morning's uh, keynote address. Again, thank you very much uh, for your partnership there. Uh, I certainly uh, just want to uh, issue a very uh, strong thank you uh, to Dr. Ron Banks uh, this morning uh, for uh, joining us and delivering this uh, address. Uh, Dr. Banks uh, is a graduate of Auburn University. Again, a few Auburn uh, grads here, uh, Dr. Banks, who uh, wanted to give the War Eagle shout out. Again, I don't know how that sounds, but uh, I think it goes something like, go Cowboys, don't know, right? Uh, Dr. Banks, a, a, very, uh, a very accomplished uh, individual, holds a certification from three uh, specialty uh, boards, American College of Animal Welfare, uh, the American College of Lab Animal Medicine, and the American College of Veterinary Preventative medicine. Dr. Banks' service in the profession began as a military working dog veterinarian and quickly focused on medical research with a residency at Walter Reed Army Institute. Now, presently, he serves as the professor of research and a director of the Division of Comparative Medicine at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Uh, from Walter Reed uh, to OU Health uh, Science and several points in between, Dr. Banks has carved out a very distinguished and fascinating uh, career that has been much about One Health research, yes, but also about advancing animal welfare. Uh, please join me in this virtual uh, 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 forum in uh, welcoming Dr. Banks uh, to the virtual podium. Dr. Banks, it's yours. Thank you, Dr. Larry. It is indeed a privilege of mine to join everyone here today. I thank you for coming. I'm assuming you can see my startup screen now. It seems to have worked well. So we will go ahead and continue. Um, I am deeply grateful for this opportunity because I recognize that of all the gifts of life, time is without a doubt the most precious gift we have. Each of us have a very limited amount of it, and I'm honored that each of you have chosen to spend some of your time with me today. So thank you to begin. Dr. Clary's introduction was um, rather more complete than I would have thought necessary. Uh, it makes me tired kind of thinking about some of the things I've been and places I've done, as he did describe from Walter Reed to OBU. I began as a student down the loveliest village on the plains, as Auburn is referred to, and I must say my visits to Stillwater thus far have revealed several similarities between Stillwater and Al Auburn, so much so I often feel like I'm at home when I'm in your neck of the woods. Thank you for that. But what's most important today is the opportunity you've gifted me with to share some discoveries along my veterinary journey that I hope you may find useful during your trek of your professional lifetime. I'll begin by saying I'm still quite excited to come to work every day or in the pandemic world occasionally work from home. As I noted to Dr. Clary, I'm not sporting a tie today. It's my own personal uh, demonstration against the pandemic, the tie will come on when the pandemic goes off. So uh, I'm, I'm a bit more informal in this uh, attire today. I do though remain very excited to be a veterinarian. It is uh, an amazing profession. It's been a remarkable lifestyle, which is not over. And I've enjoyed thus far a wonderful community of colleagues. So why don't we just get started? As you know, today's discussion is a look at one individual's career in veterinary medicine, and I'll do that by focusing upon mine. I'll provide a brief roadmap of where I hope to go in the next several minutes, beginning with a discussion of the variety that one can find in the profession, and ending with an encouragement to consider the subspecialty of research medicine as a career option for you, a place where I have found a home, but not where I intended to be when I began my journey entering as a first year student at Auburn. And by the way, Dr. Biggs, thanks for playing the War Eagle Fight song when I got on this morning. It was an inspiration, no doubt. Uh, you though, ma'am, were the fortunate one because I, I didn't sing along. So that was, that was a good thing. And what I do find most remarkable over my years in the profession has been the deepening and developing understanding of the interdependency between humans and, and between animals. While other professions like to lay claim to the argument of being the originator of One Health, it truly is veterinary medicine who has practiced One Health since our inception. We have been the ones who have guided other professions to recognize the intricacies 
between animals with whom we share this globe and the value that they bring in helping us survive as a species, uh, in part by learning from the animals who have information for which we can develop a better life, a healthier life, and a more sustainable life. That is, after all, the definition of One Health. Like most of my classmates while entering veterinary school, I knew what I wanted to be. By golly, I wanted to be a dairy veterinarian. Hasn't worked out real well for me, has it? But at that time, the declining price of milk meant there wouldn't be much of a call for dairy veterinarians upon graduation. And the price of college meant there would be a need for regular income to offset the debt from veterinary education. So quickly I learned that what I wanted to do was not exactly where I would likely end up. I needed to think of another plan, another option. Or it looked like I would be a graduate veterinarian enjoying limited income with low pay and potentially large debts. And we did need a better plan. I had grown up in, on Air Force bases around the globe. My dad was enlisted in the Air Force. And I wondered, because of that relationship, might there be federal funds of some kind I could use to offset my developing veterinary debts? There were a few options I discovered, but one was a shade more interesting than the others. There appeared to be an increasing need for veterinarians in the military at that time, especially in a field that was in its infancy called biomedical research, where the Army had become the lead agent. I didn't know anything about medical research or biomedical research, and frankly, I didn't care much about it either. The military did not have a milking herd, uh, but there were a few horses, although most horse veterinarians had quit serving after the large numbers of earlier wars in World War I and even some in World War II. But the veterinarians in the Army seemed to have a developing role for the concerns of public health, and military medicine, it appeared, was on the forefront of understanding the intersection between food safety, agricultural research, and the impact of the animal kingdom to human nutrition, specifically from the vantage point of the soldier, sailor, airman, and marine. Accompanying those conditions were growing, growing perceptions in society of the purposeful engagement that animals brought to the human condition. Shall we say the very early days of the human animal bond concept? Well, maybe it was worth exploring to see if there was a federal scholarship of some sort to offset the veterinary school cost. Maybe I should pursue that. And who knows, maybe the army might someday have a dairy and would need a veterinarian who enjoyed cows. But in any case, they had money. I needed money and they would pay. So let's see what we can do. Things were certainly not lining up the way I had designed, but they still were not very bad at all. I was offered a health profession scholarship for three years of veterinary school, but this particular chocolate from Life's Box had a hook in it. It required several years of service as an army veterinarian. And even if the army didn't have a dairy herd, at least there were still horses, albeit exhibition or parade type, but still livestock species, so it might still be fun. And it was. I served for several years straight out of veterinary school as the equine veterinarian for Fort Hood and the Fort Hood Mounted Equine Units, an 1876 styled cavalry unit, complete with barns, saddles, and all the manure one could shovel. Wasn't so bad, I sure didn't see it coming. We had regular large animal vet things to do, soundness exams for new equine purchases, regular sick call, horses do get injured, and performing health exams for both parades and transportation uh, certificates for exhibitions across the country, and some I traveled to. But when the horses were attended, there were always security dogs, patrol dogs, bomb dogs, and drug dogs, more than one could imagine. And at several locations all over West Texas. And not just military dogs, but also dogs managed by other federal agencies from Secret Service to even Border Protection. It wasn't what I thought I would do, but it was total veterinary practice and it was total veterinary fun. Whatever these animals needed, we did. Our clients were the taxpayers, so it wasn't hard choosing the right therapy for the specific condition. And the clients always paid their bills. It was a very good gig. Only once during that time did I ever receive an encouragement about my military veterinary practice. We had a military working dog that fractured a canine tooth and the tooth needed to be removed. And as you well know, canines serve a purpose, and so the tooth needed to be replaced. I engaged the post-dental clinic and a really fine dental surgeon to assist me in the procedure. He, in fact, brought his entire surgical team. It was a big deal for the dog and even a bigger deal for us. 
And so much so, we invited the military newspaper at the in institution to uh, record the activity for us. And so the surgery, a photo of the growling dog sporting a flashy dental canine implant gleaming in the sunlight made the military newspaper. And that's a really good thing, but on that day, on the bottom half of the newspaper was a story how the military was reducing retiree dental care because of cost containments. Talk about bad placement. The following day, I arrived at work and there was an invitation from the commanding general to have me come see him that morning, and I did. I walked in and very quickly he said, what do you want me to tell the dozens of retirees who have already called my office this morning wanting to know why the army can afford to give a dog a gold canine tooth and yet we can't afford to give the retirees dental care? I thought a moment and responded, sir, you can always tell the general what you want to tell him if you put sir at the beginning and the end of the sentence. And so I started by saying, sir, if the retirees can sniff out drugs or hold criminals in their bite, then I suggest you do extend dental care back to them. But these dogs, your military dogs, sir, are worth well over $60,000 a piece. And we don't have enough of them. And they keep you and keep all of us safe, sir. He paused a moment, looked at me and thanked me for my response and politely as a general does, excuse me from the room. I will say we never once saw a retiree under collar though doing any of those things. So I kind of doubt they ever got the retired care that they desired. But then I was never invited back for another audience with the commander either. So there were outcomes both ways. After about another two years at that posting, I did receive another chocolate nugget. It was for an extended tour at the demilitarized zone in Korea, which I don't think was related to the visit with the general, but that's okay. It was a new activity. And so I left and went to the DMZ and lived there for a while. It was almost farm-like. We purchased foodstuffs for the soldiers locally in those days. I had several technicians who did parasitology exams on fruits and vegetables. I spent both my days caring for military working dogs and performing anti-mortem and post-mortem inspections of swine, beef, and poultry, sometimes at local slaughter plants and sometimes out in the field. I really hadn't expected that twist. But the good news was I did see dairy cows occasionally as I was driving from point to point. It was an amazing experience for a young veterinarian. I saw diseases I'd only read about in reference books or maybe had seen library pictures of. I flew by helicopter regularly as a passenger, but at my beck and call to one of 40 different hilltop military stations along the militarized zone where working dogs were. I performed surgery on the tops of Jeeps and in the belly of helicopters and occasionally medevaced animals to our larger veterinary hospital further south in the country when their needs exceeded our frontline abilities. I participated in vaccination clinics with real disease outbreaks where immunization was consequential, not just for the animals, but for the family who were depending upon those animals for their income, for their resources. And I discovered aseptic technique had different meanings in different circumstances. But in all situations, whether sterile operatory or jeep hood operatory, good focused attentiveness to medical concepts would foster good patient outcomes. And as each adventure presented new growth opportunities, my understanding of the role of veterinary medicine and the cosmos of the human endeavor enlarged. I was practicing one health, although we didn't have a name for it then. As my scholarship commitment date approached an end, I began to wonder what the next chocolate would be the year was 1984. The U.S. Congress had just considered a new law that they had labeled the Animal Welfare Act. It was authored by a well-respected senator from Russell, Kansas, Bob Dole. The military was in desperate need for veterinarians to address this new law. And when you consider it as well, the expanding field of biomedical research, and then wanting veterinarians that had some degree of surgical skill, it seemed to be something I might like to do. I didn't know what research was. I, still couldn't care about biomedical research, but they called it experimental research and I like to do interesting things. So before long, I found myself enrolled as a resident in the laboratory animal medicine program at the Wall Street Army Institute of Research in Washington, DC. The experiences there were beyond belief, certainly not in my planned career trajectory, but rewards I scarcely could have imagined. Wonderful things occurred while I was a resident there and, and shortly thereafter, let me list a few. While a resident of Walter Reed, I was awarded a patent on a surgical procedure that we developed for a research project going on. It really seems very simple today, but at the time it was rather exciting. 
I did receive a $400 award for the patent, but I think the Army is still getting residuals. I don't think that worked out so well. I was awarded with a speaking tour of military bases in Germany looking for more veterinarians to join the research medicine field. And that trip was both business for the Army and tourism for myself and my wife. We did find a few superb colleagues who joined this subspecialty and my wife and I had a wonderful time visiting Germany in the spring. I was promoted and given increasing levels of responsibility in that period from surgical clinical veterinarian to guiding some research projects. And through that, I continued to discover the consequential impact that good animal welfare could have on research data outcomes. The implication that good animal welfare was really a core element of medical treatments. We needed to start with a clean beaker if we were going to expect a reliable outcome. I was assigned, they called it a special duty, but to speak to the senior staff at the Pentagon over something we were just seeing in those days occurring in the animal rights community. I shared with them the things that we had discovered and what I had found. And I must say my efforts in the Pentagon were only marginally successful in getting the ear of the leaders over the concerns with animal rights and animal welfare. I was also voluntold and the army, they'll ask you to volunteer. And if you don't, they're gonna tell you to do it anyway. So we refer to it as voluntold. I was voluntold to audit military medical care at various locations across the globe and to propose corrective measures for improving animal welfare in those cases that I found it necessary. Ultimately, I was tasked with leading the effort to obtain accreditation with the international group ALAC for the 13 major military hospitals in the US. I gotta say guys, absolutely none of these were in my life plan, but each chocolate I was offered was a wonderful opportunity and it came from an exceedingly diverse box of the veterinary profession. Each was unique. What a great profession this is. There were new twists and new opportunities it seemed almost every day. And through it all and to this very day, I remain amazed. I expect to receive a call at any time from Dean Johnson at Auburn reporting to me that the veterinary college finally discovered the mistake they made and I was not supposed to be entering veterinary school that I should send my diploma back and Auburn would not tell anyone about their error. Well, after all these years, that's probably not gonna happen. The grievous academic mistake they made by letting in this undisturbing student those years ago is now done and finished. But I'll tell you, it was a student that never got a football field's distance close to qualifying for a group such as Phi Seta. I applaud you and commend you for your accomplishments. And even though I sit here today sharing my career with you, some of the wonderful things, exciting things that I've seen in this profession. What a truly amazing profession this is. I attended Auburn for both my undergraduate and my veterinary degree. And that was back when Auburn had a football team and we actually won most of the time. There was something they taught us as entering students. It's called the Auburn Creed. It was written by a professor early in Auburn's years and the first verse of it goes like this. This is a practical world and I can count on only what I can earn. Therefore, I believe in work and hard work. The creed continues, but it makes my point this morning, and it still rings true. I believe in work and hard work, but I've come to discover that hard work, which is successful, usually involves others, either alongside who have, or who have set the stage for my success. There are so many more things we can accomplish. We work on the foundation laid by a team, and the team has a clear, inclusive, and focused goal in mind. The work may be hard, but having a team makes hard work successful. I'll encourage you today to find your team or build your team and be more successful than you can be alone. The team concept has been center in most of my postings and especially my academic postings at Colorado, at Duke, and now at OU Health Science Center. Here we call it Team DCM or Team Division Compared to Medicine. There are 50 or so members on Team DCM and Honestly, I can do almost every job this team has to do, but where I tried to do that, it would be a total and absolute failure. As long as this team understands our goal and performs their task appropriately, I should reserve my efforts for my role on the team and let them do theirs. A particular value to the profession and our role of team, uh, in team DCM are our veterinary nurses. 
I know that not all of our colleagues in the profession have truly bought into the concept of veterinary nurse, but I will argue we've long grown past the time when our veterinary helpers, our assistants just held animals, gave medication, or might grab a temperature check every now and then. In fact, I will document my success as a veterinarian is built on the skills of the veterinary nurses who have worked alongside me now approaching 40 years. Veterinary nurses who have leveraged my veterinary knowledge, veterinary nurses who have helped who have helped my teams become more successful in our mission and the goal of strong animal care in the interest of assuring good animal welfare. Teamwork is the secret for success and sustainment in this profession. So find your team, know your role, be an expert in the team's execution. Teamwork will also mean acknowledgement and accommodations as time, and you as a team leader will probably be the team representative. But as the picture on the screen shows, that turtle did not get on that fence post by itself. Someone placed it there and someone will place you where you will be, the foundation set before you and those working alongside. So be committed, be gracious in sharing your successes. And remember, like the turtle, you didn't get there by yourself. But also like the turtle, you can assuredly fall from that perch by yourself. Don't forget as well that you're not the last one coming down the pike. Work diligently to smooth the path for those who are following. Mind you, I didn't say make it easier and I didn't say dumb it down. I don't believe in either of those. I believe in the Auburn Creed, hard work, diligent work to push the boundaries of veterinary medicine. I have had as a life verse from scripture, the point that reads on the screen, mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak or lame will not fall, but become strong. What that means to me as a veterinarian is that my task is to smooth the path behind for the next generation of colleagues who are coming, veterinarians and veterinary nurses, so that they can deepen their success. Were it possible, I would require the state as a stipulation of continued practice licensure that every veterinarian be required to mentor and coach at least one junior colleague each year. And that before being allowed to retire, we have at least 15 or 20 colleagues that we have mentored in our career path. But I probably shouldn't go there. I never should have gotten veterinary school in the first place. So we just won't rock that boat. But it is a thought to consider and encourage when I leave. Help those who are around you and behind you. That will make you a better and stronger veterinarian. So what has my journey been like in this profession? All over the veterinary cosmos, literally. Starting with a desire to be a dairy veterinarian, I still like dairy cows the best. Diverting at one point into horses and into dogs while at Fort Hood. Adding other species as opportunities would permit themselves in a variety of locations. Eventually finding a professional home in military biomedical research, first as an experimental surgeon, and then as an animal welfare advocate, demonstrating the significance of good welfare upon reliable outcomes. I eventually retired from the Army and joined academic medicine where we don't have generals and colonels, but we do have provosts and deans, and it's really a very similar operating environment. After about a decade at the University of Colorado, though, I changed that academic headgear for that of Duke University. Where it was, I was privileged to meet and enjoy the company and professional relationship with Dr. Clary. In 2016, I retired a second time, this time from Duke University. The intent to move back to Oklahoma where my wife is from, her family is from, and just quietly live out a retired life. That lasted 37 days. So don't ask me for retirement advice. I'm an absolute and total twice failure at retirement. There are just too many cool things to do in this world. Too many exciting things to do as a veterinarian in this profession. Let me segue for a moment, if I can, into certain subspecialties, which I have familiarity with. And I would suspect many of our veterinary student colleagues do not have a clear focus upon. I know I didn't. That being of research medicine and also animal welfare medicine as a career choice in our profession. It's no one's fault or shortcoming. It's really just the way the box of chocolates are unpacked for veterinarians as we enter this field. We're often not aware of all the opportunities that veterinary medicine holds. For the next few moments, I wanna share with you some of the insight and research medicine and animal welfare that you could enjoy 
and I will encourage as a board certified diplomat. My, profession, my perception of where potential needs still remain in this subspecialty and in our profession. Research needs veterinarians. If it was on Noah's Ark, swam below it or flew above it, it is a potential research animal. I am convinced beyond any shadow of doubt that all of our earthly challenges have answers and that animals hold the secrets, if not all, then to 98% of those challenges. Animals with which we cohabit this planet. As veterinarians, we have the unique ability to facilitate the unlocking of those mysteries in our animal uh, uh, and truly bring the concept of one health into real practical application. Scientists are super smart folks. I, I know a lot of scientists. I work with scientists every day and I have for 40-ish years. But these super smart folks need practical applicability for their research ideas. And that practical applicability comes from your veterinary education. In the last several months, how many times have we seen physicians or the news media talk about herd immunity? Folks are not herds, animals are. But this is a One Health concept at its core. It is a concept that medicine, uh, that veterinarians practicing medicine do every single day. In other words, we protect the population by understanding One Health. In research, we also practice One Health concepts as veterinarians. We assist the scientists with selecting the right model system for the specific disease or the specific condition under study. We guide the engagement of the model system through a homeopathic approach, attempting to assure as normal physiology in the animal as we can while the animal is in study. We assure the model system experiences good welfare because good welfare is foundational to good science. Good animal welfare equals good scientific data, data that is reliable, defensible, and usable. Each day in research, we're learning to better recognize the nuances of the animal condition in a managed environment. And we're learning to manage the animal condition in natural environments too. We're discovering more of their social structures we're observing more of their sustainable behaviors. We're finding some of their coping abilities and we're monitoring the means with which they mitigate challenges in their life every day. Their ability is simple. It teaches us to, to manage and live and sustain the world around us. The animals we work with every day as a profession, whether companion, livestock, teaching or research, are unique sentient creatures and should never be anthropomorphized as small humans in a fur coat or a blanket of scales or a slimy covering. Research veterinarians are even today on the cutting edge of the next pandemic. Yes, there will be another pandemic. It is unavoidable. During the COVID pandemic, Team DCM, my veterinarians, veterinary nurses and husbandry staff never missed a single day of work down here at Health Science Center. In fact, while most of the state and much of the nation was shuttered and sequestered, Team DCM assured animal welfare and fostered research progress. And in part to recognize our commitment that no animal should ever be wasted, whether pandemic or not. While some institutions in the nation euthanized animals, in fact, substantial numbers of animals, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, reportedly to prevent distress and prevent suffering, Team DCM did not euthanize a single animal that was not scheduled for euthanasia as part of an ongoing active research project. We believe that through One Health, this also prevented animal distress and suffering because through it all, Team DCM assured good animal welfare every day. And so when the pandemic is downgraded to an endemic, as is now beginning to occur, I will put a tie back on. But more importantly, the biomedical research enterprise in Oklahoma 
will not have faltered or be at a low level. It will be solid and it will be ready to move smartly forward with continuing investigation for health and health care for all. The roles of veterinarians in research run an entire spectrum. Research medicine has several opportunities for growth and honestly, as many opportunities as you're willing to accept. Add to those opportunities for self-development separate from biomedical research, opportunities for service in the local, regional, or national associations and professional communities, opportunities to cross into human health care. We have veterinarians providing immunizations in the pandemic even now. One simply does not have time to retire. There are just too many fun things to do in this profession. And in research, there are often interesting financial reward, rewards for those who are prepared for those challenges. And give me one small part of a, ninth, of, excuse me, a 2018, an economic survey by the American College of Laboratory Animal Medicine. It shows us the differential salaries of individuals who are board certified in lab animal medicine and individuals who work in the same field but are not board certified. They are graduate DBMs. You can see as time goes, so does the disparity between the amount of money that you bring home. Take home lesson, becoming board certified in the AVMA, especially of your choice, it will pay. In other words, be a lifetime learner and do not stop your learning the day you graduate veterinary school. Before I allow you the opportunity to discount research as a potential career because you're not interested in lab animal medicine as a boarded specialty, let me note that research also needs other boarded colleagues, boarded veterinarians in pathology, toxicology, surgeons, and other specialties too. Let me take just a moment and highlight one specific specialty. It is that recently added to the AVMA quiver of certified specialties. The American College of Animal Welfare Organizing Committee met for the first time in 2008. I was privileged to serve on that organizing committee and our committee was chaired by Dr. Bonnie Beaver of Texas A&M, a past AVMA president. The organizing committee explored whether there was a need for a deeper dive into animal welfare, just as we have in other specialties like surgery, dermatology, and internal medicine. If the veterinary profession got sufficient animal welfare knowledge just through being a veterinarian, we are all animal welfareists, or if indeed there was a need for a board certified animal welfare veterinarian. So with a tad, well, a bit more than a tad of work, hard work, the organizing committee explored the options and concluded that yes, a new specialty was appropriate and was necessary. The organizing committee appealed to the American Board of Veterinary Specialists and in 2011, the committee was awarded provisional status as the American College of Animal Welfare. Just several weeks ago, 10 years after having provisional status, the American College of Animal Welfare was granted full college rights by the AVMA Board of Specialists. So if you're interested and this is an option, uh, think about a brand new college, the American College of Animal Welfare and get in on the ground floor. Currently there are 60 diplomated colleagues in the college and it needs more professionals to help grow. Of course, that's after you graduate from OSU. So don't get the cart in front of the horse, but keep that as an option in your longer term vision. Uh, my, my time is, coming to a close before long, but before I end my discussion today, I wanna to give one last encouragement. And that is that you do not ever forget you are, even now, the lens for the veterinary profession. And the lens you hold in front of you, colleagues, works in two ways. This lens helps you see your future, your career, your path down the road, but be aware your path may shift from time to time. And that's not a bad thing. I still like dairy cows, but I found a home where I am needed and I can be effective in the execution of veterinary medicine where I currently serve. But this lens also is the way that others view this profession. It is the way they will see you in the way you live, the way you work, the way you play, the way you interact with others. 
Therefore, my encouragement is as best as you are able to do, keep your lens clear, focused, and inviting in both directions. Let me close my notes today by just sharing with you a standing invitation that each of the students at OSU have to visit the Oklahoma University Health Sciences Center. Our veterinary staff here would be pleased to host a day trip for you to investigate the opportunities for veterinarians in biomedical research. Now I say that and please not the entire veterinary class call tomorrow and wanna to come on Friday. We can't handle everyone like that. But if you are interested, we'll take ones or twosies or a small group, whatever you would like to do. Call and send an email and we will make it happen because I wanna be sure you understand opportunities that are before you that you can take advantage of. And things at the Health Sciences Center down here are growing substantially. We're in the process now, we've received $10 million of federal money to develop a translational research facility, or we'll be looking at that part of biomedical research that is often missed, basic research and clinical research. We're going to focus on translational research. What do we do when the information is first defined and how can we carry that information through higher species before it gets into the human or clinical trials? We've also been privileged to receive a federal grant and are in the process of having built, it'll be live in the summer of 2023, a 4.7 Tesla MRI research magnet, which can also be used for clinical purposes. But new opportunities for our region of the country, new opportunities for Oklahoma, and new opportunities for veterinarians who are willing to, able to, and motivated to serve biomedical research as veterinary professionals. That being said, I thank you colleagues for this opportunity. I hope maybe a lesson or two of mine you have picked up on and may remember through your veterinary journey. It has been a wonderful profession and I'm not done yet. But until that day is true, I thank you for the privilege of serving alongside. Dr. Clary, I thank you as well, sir, for this invitation to speak today. With that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Banks. Uh, excellent uh, presentation, just uh, fascinating. Uh, we have a, a couple minutes for uh, some questions, uh, if you don't mind. Sure, sir. Uh, certainly uh, anyone who has a question, if you're able to put it in the Q&A, uh, feel free to do so. You uh, mentioned uh, just in your professional journey, uh, Dr. Banks, uh, working in the military for some time, uh, working hard to try and convince folks even at the, at the top, the Pentagon, just on the reality of animal rights and uh, what, a, uh, uh, what an appropriate response would be uh, to, uh, to animal rights uh, for those who are uh, intending and who are uh, advocating research involving animals. You know, what's your message uh, today? If you could uh, give a message to the Pentagon uh, about uh, animal rights uh, and animal research, uh, what would your message be? They haven't gone away. They will never go away. At that time, a lot of people thought the whole animal rights question was just a flash in the pan. It would be to go through a few news cycles, maybe a year or so, and then like other movements, it would die off. And clearly that's not been the case. I think in large part, my message today would be because the veterinary profession has not truly stepped to the front and said, we believe in animal welfare, but that is not the same as animal rights. I would remind the folks as well that as of this point, there is not a single computer where we can inject a putative vaccine and determine whether it will be efficacious at preventing disease. I will say that there are certain advances and I as a research veterinarian look forward to the day when animals are no longer necessary for biomedical studies. And there have been certain research advances. In my career alone, the, the whole science of radiation science or radiological science, in the beginning days, hundreds of animals were used on a regular basis. Now, rarely do we ever use an animal in, in radiologic sciences because we have the mathematical models to replace them, because we have the computer simulations to replace that. And so that's been a success story that uh -huh. if we had listened totally to the rights community in those days, we might not have to be. I look forward, Dr. Carey, to the uh, time when you were out of job, at least as far as it involves biomedical research. And surgeons are no longer necessary. <laughs> and mouse husbandry are no longer necessary. 
uh, when animals are no longer necessary for research. But until that day comes, veterinarians need to be at the forefront assuring good animal welfare, which can occur, and at OU Health Science Center does occur, in the biomedical research laboratory. Good animal welfare equals good science. And that should be our primary focus at this point and, and going forward. Excellent. Uh, what, one of our colleagues in the, uh, the chat line is just asking, you know, how can young professionals uh, you know, function to defend uh, the use of animal research? So you know, perhaps uh, young professionals, and even in private practice, getting questions or comments from uh, from uh, you know clients on uh, current events because uh, as you know sometimes animal rights uh, stories uh, hit the uh, national press and whatever else but how can young professionals uh, defend the use of animals in research? The absolute best way is to learn what goes on inside of biomedical research. There are very few veterinarians or veterinary students or pre-vet students when I walk with them through an animal holding facility and they see the kinds of conditions the animals live in. Or when we walk and watch a research surgery and they see the accoutrements that are provided for the animal's well being, after that experience is over, almost categorically, I had no idea. I had no idea. I'm, I'm a veterinarian and, and that's what I am to my core. And I have worked in private practice and I understand the challenges of dealing with clients who have the ultimate opinion of saying whether their animal can receive certain treatments or not. In biomedical research, veterinarians are the clients. We have to say whether the animals receive that kind of treatment or not. Hmm. It doesn't happen often because we try to build a strong partnership with the researchers. But if a researcher wishes an animal to continue in study and the veterinary staff says the animal is experiencing pain, suffering, or is in distress in a manner that we cannot mitigate, a veterinarian's opinion rules. A half dozen or so times a year, I make a call. This animal is being removed from the study because we cannot manage its condition. It is euthanized. It does not continue in modern biomedical research profiles. Uh, fortunately, that is rare because if we partner properly and we look at good welfare from the animal's perspective and we assist the animal in coping with condition that it's living in, most animals can cope effectively through a combination of non-pharmaceutical, non environmental, or maybe even medicinal means, we can set the standards so the animals can cope effectively the vast majority of the time. But when that can no longer exist, a veterinarian pulls the plug, calls for euthanasia, and the animal's life is ended humanely. I think that's probably the best thing young professionals could do is educate yourself. Visit your facility there at OSU or come down here to Health Sciences Center. You're a member of Oklahoma. You have rights to know what's going on, and I'll show you and tell you what's going on in your state institutions out there. Excellent. You, uh, you're working, obviously, in a human medical uh, environment. Uh, many of the researchers I'm sure you work with are uh, physicians, uh, physician researchers, clinical researchers. Uh, are there uh, unique aspects to the interaction with uh, those trained in human medicine uh, when it comes to animal research and maybe their perceptions of, uh, of animal care and animal welfare? Uh, how, how does that play out these days? That, that's a really interesting question. And I would suggest that the perception others have of you or our profession depends upon how you present yourself and our profession. We do occasionally have new MD faculty who join the campus and they have a rather stained opinion of veterinarians and veterinary care. And those folks take a bit of time to win over. But I'll tell you that at the Health Sciences Center in the five, almost five years I've been here, I don't go into any meeting these days where someone doesn't say Dr. Banks. They do not say, oh, the vet's here. They don't say, Ron, take a seat at the end of the table. They say Dr. Banks. There is a mutual collegiality on this uh -huh. campus between MDs and DVMs. Um, you know, we are guilty as a profession and maybe as individuals of taking the second seat, even on human medical campuses. Mm. Scientists are super smart. MDs are also super smart. They have their special skill set. But I'll never forget as a young veterinarian having an MD surgeon decide that he wanted to do his own spay on his own animal. And he did the spay on his own animal. And since veterinarians do things in the field, he thought he would do it at home too. 
And yet he called me and asked if I would help him recover the case because his incision line dehisced mm -hmm. and there was cat litter inside the abdomen. Classic example of the thinking of knowing the anatomy proper, but not knowing the differences. Even a better example, a physician who wanted to do thoracic uh, surgery, cardiovascular surgery on a, uh, a pig, and in the discussion said, it's not a big deal. We crack human chest all the time. We'll put them back together this way and such, and it'd be fine and dandy. And I noted to him that animals are not vertical, but are horizontal. Mm -hmm. And somewhere around 60% of their body weight is carried on their front limbs. And that'll be putting pressure on the crack he made in the thoracic line. His humans don't walk around on four limbs. Mm -hmm. uh, it was as if a light had gone off in his head. So colleagues, the point I'm making is veterinarians have a very specific role to play on a human campus and with human medicine and in human-based research. Your role is to bring in the animal perspective and ensure the needs of the physician will be met with a proper outcome by an animal that can experience good well. That's, that's a great response. I know in my experience there at Duke as a researcher working with uh, surgeons and others, it was very rare that I would find someone who didn't care about the welfare of the animals, uh, but their ability to understand uh, how animals manifest uh, pain, uh, you know, is, uh, is limited to some extent. So the opportunity to educate there and then uh, demonstrate that uh, kind of going back to what you were talking about, just this the notion of, you know, it takes a team. Uh, veterinarians bring a lot to the table, and I appreciated you bringing that out in the conversation. Uh, we did have a, a question uh, from a colleague. Uh, I'm sure you know him well, Dr. Ken Bartels. Uh, Dr. Bartels uh, is asking uh, about surgical training um, in uh, human uh, medicine, uh, maybe there at OU and other places. Uh, are they still using animals in surgical training? Uh, and if so, uh, is that uh, diminished? Uh, is there a, a trend towards decreased uh, usage? And if so, why? Good day, Dr. Bartles. Dr. Bartles and I go way back. Dr. Bartles also served in the military. We did not know each other in the military, but both of us were promoted to the rank of colonel on the same set of promotion orders, which we discovered about 10 or 12 years later while serving on a Navy May committee. So the veterinary world is very, very small. It's good to hear from a dear friend. Uh, yes, the use of animals from surgical training has changed dramatically during my lifetime in this profession. Upon entering, one of the duties I did early on was to support human surgical skills training for emergency physicians and nurses, as well as surgeons. And in those days, it was one animal per one trainee. Those days are long gone. In those days also, it was more emotive species. Dogs were commonly the animals that were used back then. In those days are long gone. Why were dogs used? Because they were plentiful, they were easy to come by, but they were not representative of the human condition. Nowadays, when those types of trainings occur, we're more likely to use farm animals, pigs, goats, because of their greater similarity to human tissues and human responses to the manipulation and other kinds of things. But even the numbers of animals these days have dropped dramatically because these days it's generally considered one animal per four or six surgeon trainees or emergency room trainees, dependent upon which procedures are being done. And almost routinely the procedures are being video filmed to a secondary location. So it's not just obtaining information from those who are manipulating tissues, but it's also sharing information from those at a distant location. Maybe the distance is just next door but a distant location where there is a facilitator in the room talking about the procedure and talking and walking through the process. So yes, it has indeed changed. There's also the use of mannequins, uh, uh -huh. animal mannequins or anatomic mannequins, and those have their places. Uh, and even some of the fancier ones these days will cut when you bleed them. Uh -huh. I confess though, to being an old school surgeon, I do like to still be able to make an incision and see the microcapillary start to ooze. That tells me that the animal's alive and it gives me the opportunity to respond to that condition, protect the animal's well-being and accomplish the task that I have in hand. So to Dr. Bartle's main point, the numbers are less, the species have changed, the focus is more intent uh -huh. and the sharing of information is much more intentional that whatever animal is used is shared maximally for anyone who can benefit from that training activity. Yeah, excellent. Certainly in veterinary surgical 
training, uh, you know, there, there will be no, no crying if we could ever reach the day where uh, we don't need uh, to use uh, animals in uh, uh, preclinical uh, training uh, exercises and things like that. Dr. Definitely Clark, simulate, what, what's that? Dr. Clary, may I also add one more point? Um, yes, sir. My mind every now and then pops in another ear on and it just happened. A substantial amount of the training these days is with cadavers. Mm -hmm. In fact, I happen to know rather personally several of the goat slaughter facilities in the area or places that process deer or, or other species because there are times uh, when we have research studies or training studies that we don't need the live animal, we just need mm -hmm. the body parts and mm -hmm. parts to simulate size or to simulate function. And so any day someone may come to visit, we may have cadavers in our freezer from research studies and we may also have goat heads or pig limbs or bladders or whatever the case, also there awaiting either a training exercise or a research enterprise. Yeah, excellent. Uh, same, same trend in veterinary surgical education. Much can be accomplished with inanimate models, uh, particularly some of the basics, you know, how to handle needle holders and things like that and start okay. basic suture patterns. Uh, and, but then uh, moving to cadaver uh, specimens uh, when uh, when needed, uh, but def definitely the trend of decreasing usage, uh, also uh, altered species, uh, that, uh, that has uh, been the case in veterinary surgery as well. Last question, uh, one colleague wants to know, how many veterinarians are in your group uh, there at OU? Uh, I serve as the director of the Division of Comparative Medicine. Dr. Wendy Williams serves as our senior clinical veterinarian and also our institutional attending veterinarian. The role of attending veterinarian is a regulatory position, so, I say with tongue in cheek, Dr. Williams stands between the USDA and the university, and I stand off to the side helping her out. Uh, not, not true, but she serves as our senior clinical and also the attending. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sean Lane, who is a, 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 a OSU graduate, serves as our a, a clinical ven veterinarian. He, um, he knows, so I'm not talking out of school, he will be moving to the role of senior clinical vet in July. He's been with us now several years coming out of private practice. And Dr. Lane tells me when I ask him, are you ready to go back in private practice? And he begs, please don't, don't do that to me. So he really believes he's come to research and found, found his home. Uh, we're glad to have Dr. Lane. And we also currently on staff have two residents, Dr. Deidre Marchi, uh -huh. graduated from St. Pitts, a wonderful school down in the Caribbean where I would never be able to go because I would be on the beach and not in class. But Dr. Marchi is now our second year laboratory animal residence. Uh, she currently holds the role down at Norman. Our campus also supports the Norman campus with animal care and use, where they deal more primarily with uh, environmental species, uh, natural species, uh, so a lot more field-based kind of activities. But Dr. Marchi serves in both places as our second year uh, resident. Our uh, first year resident is Dr. Clissa Root. Dr. Root is a Texas A&M graduate. Uh, yes, we do try to forgive that this over the side of hers, but, uh -huh. uh, and I can't tell the jokes I would otherwise in respect to Dr. Root, uh, but we do very much appreciate having her here. She's a, a wonderful veterinarian coming from private practice, uh, pretty much with a fair amount of non-traditional species experience. And I think both of our residents are finding a real love for this profession in biomedical research. I will note that we have in July the ability to move Dr. Marchi to the third year resident position, Dr. Root to the second year resident position, and we'll have an opening for a first year resident, which we are currently in the process of seeking and, and securing. So our program at OU, uh, after one July of this year, will always have three residents, one in each of the three years. After the third year, the resident is prepared to sit for the board examination in laboratory animal medicine, and then they're uh, more than willing to go off into the world, wherever that may be, and serve as a fully functioning laboratory animal veterinarian. Excellent. Uh, one last real quick question uh, for uh, veter uh, veterinary students who may be wondering, uh, are opportunities for residencies in lab animal medicine, do those go through a matching program? They do, they do. And we went through the matching program this year. Uh, we did not get a student out of the matching program. Uh, there were more matches than there were students. And, be very blunt and honest, Oklahoma is the center of the country and you know we're still kind of flyover-ish. So we're building our foundation. Uh, we're creating our infrastructure. We're getting residents in and we're gonna do fine. Uh, I know we're gonna do better in years to come, but yes, it is part of the matching program. Very good. 
Well, Dr. Banks, uh, echoing your comments in our uh, chat uh, line as well, I just want to thank you for an excellent presentation and for uh, giving of your time uh, this morning. Uh, we so appreciate uh, you sharing uh, your journey, yes, but also just uh, you know giving some vision for colleagues in terms of uh, the importance of research and how research, as you said, truly needs better in areas. Thank you so much for your time and thank you, Dr. Banks. My pleasure. Y'all come, but not all at once.